everyone. My name is Jessica Dill. I am a library assistant with the Livingston Parish Library Watson Branch. We are here today to chat with the author of New Orleans Vampires History and Legend, Marita Voivot Crandall. Hello. <laughs> This book weaves historical fact with vampire myth, and not only is Marita an author, she is the owner of several vampire-themed shops on the French Quarter, Boutique du Vampire and the, vampire, the New Orleans Vampire Cafe, which just opened on January 1st. Well, Ms. Crandall, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. We also have a little speakeasy called Potions. Um, we're temporarily closed because of COVID, but if you find your way into the French Quarter and um, you know are interested in such a thing, make sure you ask them at the boutique and they'll give you the password to get in. So I've read the book, of course, and now I want to explore all the, those locations in New Orleans. <laughs> and we can, you can do so if I'm correct. Yes, yes, you can. Everywhere you can, well, if you can't go inside the uh, convent attic, mm -hmm. but we'll get to that in a little bit. I'll tell you about some secret stuff. Okay. Well, so first of all, what inspired you to write a book about the vampire legends of New Orleans? Well, I was working on a novel. Um, I've been a writer for a long time, but mostly I had columns in magazines. And I, was, I had an idea for a novel based on one of the legends, which is the Carter Brothers. Mm -hmm and I was working on it. And then all of a sudden I got a, um, a query from History Press, Arcadia Publishing. They asked me if I would like to submit a proposal for a book based on the legends of where the vampire, or based on the history of where the vampire legends came from. And I thought well, I would be crazy not to do that because I'll basically be doing the research I need to do and you know, getting a book done and paid for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I submitted the proposal and luckily they accepted it. And so I stopped my novel uh, temporarily and dived into the research. And it was really fascinating. And I was really inspired to write it because there's so many different tour companies in New Orleans mm -hmm. and you can hear them going by. And in fact, most of them stop by uh, in front of my shop and they talk about my teeth. It's really funny because I happen to have natural things mm -hmm. and they'll talk to their uh, customers on the tour and say, she only comes out at night and look at her fangs, you know, <laughs> it's really funny. But anyway, um, they all have different stories when it comes to the legends. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know what, I don't want to ruin the legends, but I really was very curious, wh where did they start? How did we get these three legends and why are they all so different from every tour company? Mm -hmm. So it was really the most fascinating research because they are all based mm -hmm. on actual fact. Mm -hmm. And I was able to go in and streamline so that the tour guides actually have a true story of you know mm -hmm. what happened and how it happened and and then you let your imagination run wild mm -hmm. so i didn't ruin the legends i just mm -hmm. really you know narrowed down where they originated mm -hmm. and i was able to um actually fix things that other historians have made mistakes in the past mm -hmm. a lot of them which blew my mind just took other people's words for it they're like mm -hmm. oh yeah you know this was said in so and so i'm like well that wasn't true so when i do research i go back to the very very first time something was mentioned or you know I, i'm like a big footnote person i like to mm -hmm. find out exactly where this stemmed from right. so if you read my book you'll know you have the absolute truth right so that's, that's what started the whole thing and then um and then I went back to writing my novel after that, but I, I needed a madam to be a, um, a love interest for Wayne Carter, which is one of the legends. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at uh, Josie Arlington and she was a really amazing person in addition to being a mm -hmm. madam in the Storyville time. But I chose her as my madam, and then I temporarily stopped writing my novel again because History Press was interested in having a book just about her. Ah. So basically I've written two history books in preparation for my novel, which will come out this year. So how much research did you have to do for the New Orleans vampires, the history? A lot. And the history? <laughs> A lot. Uh, so it was about, it took me a year to write the book and about uh, two thirds of that was doing the research. Mm -hmm. And so I did, I looked everywhere. I went to um, the New Orleans Historic Collection, which has become one of my favorite places in the world to be. There's just everything at your fingertips. And there's a great gentleman that works there, Bobby Tickner, who really helped me a lot. Um, you know, 
teaching me how to find the research that I needed. Yeah. And then also our public library, I spent mm -hmm. a oodles of time mm -hmm. there, uh, Tulane University, UNO. Um, there, I mean, we're so lucky because everything is right at my fingertips here. Yeah. So you know, I did about, you know, uh, yeah, two thirds of the year I was spent on research. And um, well, I, I want to tell you about the convent attic. That was another research part. Can I, should I jump into that? Or? Oh, yes, please. That's so, probably my favorite myth. So yeah, I love this one. So the casket girls, um, and th that one has really the most meat to it as well, as far yeah. as where it came from. Casket girls were a group of young girls that came from France to help populate our city with a higher class of people just so that the men that were here working would be inclined to stay because they were primarily, you know, um, woodsmen and from Canada and wanderers. And so they would get a job done and they'd want to wander again. So they really needed some attractive women that would build a homestead here. And the first attempts really failed. They used um, prostitutes and prisoners from France, and that just had a very poor outcome. They also tried to the Indian women here. Um, men kind of went to their way, and it was more of a relaxed lifestyle, so they didn't want to work as hard. So finally, um, the casket girls came, and they were young orphans from Le Cepeterre, which is a, was a horrible place in France, a hospital for you know, mentally ill and um, it was just an awful, awful place. So they went from a really bad situation to a worse situation because they were promised, you know, this wonderful existence here, right. but it wasn't wonderful. It was a horrible, mm -hmm. it was swamps and mosquitoes and no food and, you know, nothing. And uh, and they were sold off, you know, basically to, to men. But anyway, the legend is that they came over on the ship, the Baleen, and, uh, and which they did. And uh, that on the ship, they were turned into vampires. And it was a really horrible plot by Sister Gertrude, who was one of the nuns. And so, um, but the nuns felt that because they take care of women, they felt compelled to still have them under their care because it wasn't the girl's fault that they were vampires. So they're to this day housed in the attic of the Ursuline convent. And so it's on all the tours when you walk by, all the shutters are sealed shut, which is very unusual in mm -hmm. our city because shutters would naturally be open up high because that's right. what heat rises. And so it is very odd. Mm -hmm. And um, I am one of the few people in the world that's had a private tour of the Ursuline Convent attic. And I'll tell you what, it was a magical, mysterious, eerie experience. And they wouldn't let me publish it in the book. Mm -hmm. So if you go to my website, yes. it's just it's my name, and I'm sure you'll have that there, mm -hmm. um, and go to the research tab, I wrote everything as I experienced it with pictures and everything, and it will give you chills. It's just, I love that so much. I think about it all the time. It was a magical experience. I have visited your web, your website and I have seen those pictures. <laughs> and the, it, the one with the indentions is really, really wild. It's like, it leaves a lot to the imagination. It does. <laughs> it really it, does. It way better than I ever could have anticipated it Oh, being. yeah. Yeah. It was great. And you just wonder why, like, why are the shutters closed? Why are there th the these intentions? In the <laughs> yeah. And the chains, you know, held that to, in the back room. And there was one floor with just brick so they could wash the body, like, fluids down. Like, you know, what, from vampires? Like, you know, right. what was going on in there, yeah. And these are the things that we do not, as natives to Louisiana, get to learn in our Louisiana history class. Right, exactly. So. <laughs> That's where I come in. <laughs> yes, you bridge that the the truth the the truth and then the fiction and then the possible otherworldly. <laughs> right. Which New Orleans very much has a culture of otherworld. Yes. Yes. Definitely. I mean, it's you know a lot of people say it's because the city is so old that mm -hmm. we're so haunted and have all these legends. Yeah. But I'm from Germany and we are a baby compared yeah. to everywhere else. So I don't think it's because it's old. I think right. it's because the people that are attracted to the vibe of the city, which mm -hmm. is an old vibe, mm -hmm. but uh, are attracted to this, you know, this culture mm -hmm. and all the things that we've experienced from the prisoners mm -hmm. and from the prostitution and drugs and um, pirates and uh, slavery mm -hmm. and then the culture of food and the music mm -hmm. I think that they don't want to leave is one reason you know mm -hmm. when people so many people have the story that I have where you just don't want to leave you just mm -hmm. love it here and I think that even in the afterlife you know people are just want to still stay 
So. Right. And we could talk forever about the gates of Guinea and all of that. <laughs> right. By the way, um, um, I don't know if you know about Elise Arden, but mm -hmm. Elise Arden uh, wrote The Casket Girls, yes. which is, you know, obviously based on the three vampire legends here. And there's four books in the series now. And the last one was Gates of Guinea or Guinea. Gina, yeah. Um, and uh, and it, that just came out uh, February 19th. Mm -hmm. So if you like, um, you know, supernatural and New Orleans history and, um, uh, mystical writing it's amazing it's I think one of the best series out there so yes. the casket girls by Elise Arden and Elise is A-L-Y-S yep I can vouch um I have read the first three I have yet to read the fourth one but I can definitely vouch for what Marita says you've got to read those books that they, they are steeped in New Orleans in culture and the, the the myths that you get a little bit of the historical from Marita and then you can get the the all the fiction and the mist and the fantasy and the paranormal from Elise Arlen <laughs> yeah so speaking of which the way you write at least in my opinion and like you just mentioned leaves the reader with enough mystery as to choose whether they believe in your stories or in that existence of vampires um, it's like asking the question, are we alone in the universe? How has your own belief in vampires or the supernatural in general been challenged or changed due to the research of, for your book? So, you know, and, and also just being in New Orleans, you know, before I moved here, and like I said, I'm from Germany and, um, I don't really know a lot of great ghost stories there, which is weird, um, but there's so much of that here. And I have never experienced anything until I moved here. And I've actually had a couple of ghost experiences myself, but I was a bartender on Bourbon Street for many years mm -hmm. and my customers and even the customers from the shop, you know, mm -hmm. like people come in and they, they just want to naturally talk about supernatural experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I've had so many great ghost stories from really credible people that, um, you know, it just, there is something else out there. I mean, what I've witnessed myself, and the crazy part is, the longer it is since I've witnessed it, I my memory is starting to fade from what I actually saw. And that's kind of frustrating to me. It, yeah. I'm more remembering my my stories about it than my actual, you know, memory of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but anyway, so when it comes to vampires, so I've always loved vampires, mm -hmm. even as a little girl. But I never believed in vampires. I just, you know, I wanted to, obviously, when I was younger. I right. thought it was a great thing. And, and, and you wonder why that is. Why do we have this fascination with a creature yeah. that can kill you? And right. It's really, uh, it's horrible, you know. I mean, you live on blood and, like, it's terrible. But uh, we have this, you know, fascination because of what they've morphed into. So, I, you know, I really didn't don't believe in vampires. I think mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting that every culture has a vampire. So there's something yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think spurs me to want to do more and more research of why that is in you know even in asia they're very different than our vampires they hop and every I mean, every single culture has one yeah. and so part of that will be answered in my novel the third part of my novel so i think you'll really like that but um i had one vampire experience of my own which i is it was yes. just chilling and um i to this day believe that what happened you know was it was just nothing really freaks me out and mm -hmm. i mean you know, a person walking into the shop, I don't care if they, they say they're a werewolf or whatever, you know, I mean, you're just not going to believe it, right? Right. This man walked into my shop one night when I was all by myself, and my dog was growling at him the whole time he was in there, which was very unusual. And that might be one of the reasons I was nervous, because I wanted to make him at ease, because it was so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And he was, if you could picture what you would really believe a vampire to look like, if you weren't going the Nosferatu route, mm -hmm. but like, you know, like a modern day man that may be a vampire. He was thin, he was well-dressed in like tailored clothing to himself. Um, he had a really expensive cane. He was about maybe 45 years old with short salt and pepper hair, um, attractive and spoke with a Romanian accent. And I kept wanting to, to, for myself, make it Greek or Italian or, no, it wasn't Romanian, but it was Romanian. Like the more I thought about it and thought about it. Anyway, when he was in there, um, I had my hand on my dog's head and trying to get her to calm down. She was a big German Shepherd. And the first time she's ever done this. 
And so this growling, you know, vibrating through me, obviously must have caused some uh, anxiety in me. But anyway, the whole weird part about it, I won't tell you the whole story because it's in my book, but the part that really resonates with me is that um, when he talked to me finally, which he ignored me the whole time he was in the shop, he, when he finally spoke to me, he acted as though the shop was a compliment to him. Hmm. And that was what I took away from it. Like, why yeah. did he act like that? Like, you know, and then he says, I know people who would be very interested in this. And, but it was to himself, not to me at all. He just wasn't talking to me. And when he disappeared, and I'll, again, I'll let you read how that happened, but um, it was really pretty chilling. And I know like when I'm alone in my shop at night, sometimes the hair on my neck stands up because I expect mm -hmm. him to walk in the room mm -hmm. and I know I'm going to see that man again. Mm -hmm. I know it. And yeah. I, you know, like I said, I don't believe in vampires, but I kind of do now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. That, there, there's something yeah. about the man that was very vampire-y. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those experiences that change us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It lit that little, you know, that little question in my mind, mm -hmm. and which is probably good for me as an author mm -hmm. that I do have that little question in right. my mind. Do you, okay, so we spoke of the Carter brothers and the Ursuline convent. Uh, what's your favorite myth? Or is it one of those or is it the third one? <laughs> um, well, I love St. Germain because St. Germain was an amazing person. He really was an amazing human being. And then, you know, through the centuries, because of the way he behaved, he always spoke as though he had lived 500 years in the past, no yeah. matter what decade they put him in. And, uh, but the actual man, you know, when I was doing that research, I was enthralled with it because mm -hmm. there's so many legends that have come from it that are not real, but the, the actual right. truth is more fascinating. Right. But, but he really was such a, an alchemist mm -hmm. that he was able to actually fix diamonds. You know, the things we use now, techniques we use today, he used then. It took him longer, mm -hmm. but he actually was able to do it. And he was just a brilliant, brilliant person. And he was also very altruistic in that he wanted to help economies. He wanted to help the economy of France by gifting them this new technique of, of painting, mm -hmm. of um, uh, colors, being more vibrant, you know. And what's, I think, the most fascinating story from that legend to me is um, while he was um, in London, he walked into a small op opera house across from the large King's Opera House. And he sat down and just with his eloquence, they allowed him to sit in and he sitting there wrote several arias. And one that he wrote became so popular that every time the, our, the main singer, I can't think of her name now, uh, sang it, uh, they got a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this particular aria, um, when the king's, king's um, the gentleman who ran the King's Opera House retired, he bought his wife a house called Four Maids Row, um, Four Maids on a Row. And it's a huge mansion. And in that house, a very famous artist in the entryway painted a sm many murals, but a small mural over the entry door of music notes open to an aria. Mm -hmm. And it was St. Germain's aria and it was dedicated to him. It's like all in gold, it's beautiful. It's, there's a picture of it in my book. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what's so fascinating about this is that that aria was never played at the King's Opera House and that this gentleman who ran the King's Opera House would have picked that aria to celebrate in his home and then dedicate it to Saint Germain and it's um, encircled with the flower of um, uh, Trinity. Um, what is it? Uh, oh. I can't think of the name of the flower now, but it's going to come to me. Anyway, it's encircled with that. So again, not talking about everlasting life and, yeah. you know, and why? Like, what is that all about? So I was obsessed with having to find that book when I read about it. And I, I tried everything. I contacted real estate brokers. And finally, I, I did find out that the house was for sale, the mansion. And I contacted a, um, the photographer who took photos of it. And sure enough, that that mural is still there. So wow. I paid to have the actual picture of the mural in my book. And I've never been so happy to find something. And that photographer said yeah. he's never had anybody so happy to buy a <laughs> picture from him. I was just, I mean, it's amazing that it still exists. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that it exists. Yeah. So what was it about this man and eternity? Mm -hmm. You know, and so there's, there again, there's that little question about, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, why is this myth lasting on so long? And right. It, yeah. So I think that's probably, that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And I think of any myth that's not in my book, is um, the fact that vampires in, in the past could turn into fog. I'm really captivated oh. with that. I've never used it in anything I've written, but I think um, it's pretty magical because, you know, our cells are um, 
there's cells in everything, like the houses and you know, everything has cells mm -hmm. and that they can come apart and come back mm -hmm. together. There's something to that too. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to work with that in the future possibly, mm -hmm. but I like fog and vampires turning into fog. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's um, something you don't see much of mu anymore. Um, I think the Vampire Diaries kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, and then Alucard can morph into fog. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it's, a, it's a lesser known but equally intriguing aspect of their being. Because <laughs> right. you can really sneak in anywhere that way. Yeah. 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 That will eventually hit you know, something. Yeah. But, yeah, you I can like seep that. into doors and windows. I mean, chimneys. Just right. anything. That would be my secret vampire power. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder though, would it um, somehow contradict the whole being invited in? <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, good point. Um, so you, the way you write and you capture New Orleans so you know, evocatively and you've touched on that you're not from there, you are from Germany. Um, and there's a bit in your book about your life in California and your marketing career. So what made you decide to give up all of that to move to New Orleans and open up Boutique de Vampire? Well, it, it really was the magic of New Orleans that sucked me in. And like I said, I'm not the only one who has this story. Many, many people I've met have the same story. But I yeah. came on business and I literally stepped foot into the French Quarter. And I remember when my parents took us to Disneyland, um, I was enthralled with Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. I wanted to escape and live there. Mm -hmm. And when I stepped foot into the French Quarter, I was like, wow, this is like the adult Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. And I just, I hated leaving every time. So finally I got a little apartment here mm -hmm. and I thought it'd make me feel better. I would have a little piece of, you know, okay. New Orleans. But I moved here Halloween weekend to help promote Vampire Wine at the mm -hmm. Endless Night Vampire event. And I never left my apartment. I sold my house over the phone and oh, wow. moved here. And then I thought, you know, um, what can I do? And I, I thought vampires really have a good place here, but there's nowhere for people to really investigate them. There's a vampire yeah. tours. So 18 years ago, I opened Boutique to Vampire and people thought I was crazy, but it was a really good move because we are number one on TripAdvisor. We've attracted a collection of over 130 artists that make unbelievable products for us that, you know, customers are just dying to, mm -hmm. to have uh, creepy dolls, um, jewelry, uh, beautiful things. And we make a lot of our own products in the shop. Mm -hmm. I have an outstanding staff that's so driven and you know so creative. And they just, they love the shop as much as I do. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I'm very, very lucky to have attracted those kind of people. Yeah. Um, but no, there's something about the city and they say that Marie Laveau had put a spell on the city that you would either hate it or love it. Mm -hmm. And that if you loved it, you had to come back. Mm -hmm. And it has to be true because that, I mean, like I said, just walking on the street you just, you know, you feel this connection to yeah. the city. And once you feel it, you, you have to come back. It's right. Just, yeah. It's, yeah. So that's why I'm here. I agree. <laughs> it's, it's definitely um, captivating. Yeah. And we have so much. I mean, there's so much in the legends, too. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, voodoo and slavery yeah. and um, ghosts and pirates. And I mean, there's so much to, to, yeah. to talk about in Storyville and mm -hmm. the opium dens that were here once. And, yeah. Uh, the swamps, you know, and the mysticism around the swamps, and uh, there's just overwhelming amount of uh, material for writers and artists, and so it keeps attracting creative people yeah. and becoming more and more creative. Yeah, it's like a tangible thing almost that you can not just sense, but like you're able to touch it and interact with it, and it, it's more—it's more than words can describe, really um that that missed that that um uh magnetism yes yeah i agree yeah so we uh you know mentioned that it is possible to visit the places mentioned in your book um however as we all know there are the restrictions due to COVID 19 in place and even the traditional way in which we celebrate mardi gras this year has been canceled um so my question is, was it a challenge or were you any, in any way nervous about opening the Vampire Cafe during a pandemic? So 
you know, when the pandemic first happened, I was terrified. I really was. I was really terrified. And I've never been terrified before. I've, I've had really high stress jobs and I've always worked well under pressure, but I've never been um, in danger of losing our lives and our right. livelihood. You know, yeah. I was, I mean, it was real serious. My husband is 61 and has diabetes mm -hmm. and he's black. Yeah. And I have um, uh, a pre like, what is it? Um, I was bitten by mosquitoes and got a disease called chikanoia, which brings on okay. rheumatoid arthritis. Oh. And so I had to be careful too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were locked in our house and I thought, I can't let my shop go. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. So I talked to my staff and we all just powered on our website. Yeah. And our website had not been very successful, but I'd always wanted to put more time into it because mm -hmm. I actually love the website and, you know, that you can uh, bring this experience across the world. And so mm -hmm. I used to do all kinds of fun things with it, but it just wasn't working. Anyway. I really did a lot. I took a lot of classes and I did a lot of research and we were able to bring the website sales up to a really nice position so that now it's a whole nother business okay. and um, we have to continue to do that. But it, mm -hmm. so that really helped. So I, I wasn't thinking about opening a restaurant at all. I, and mm -hmm. I didn't want a restaurant really. I have a, you know, I love my little speakeasy. Mm -hmm. However, um, next door to my shop, the, it's actually the front of the building. My shop is the, the slave quarters of what the front of the building was. It was a grocery store a long time ago. And then there's a courtyard in between us. And so um, I have the whole back building. It's my, um, my shop, my apartment, and then our office. So it's three different levels. And then we have the beautiful courtyard and then there's a, a gate between us and then there's the restaurant. So they closed the restaurant after COVID and the owners, had, um, owners of the building had taken it over and tried to make a go of it because their father used to run a grocery store here. So I thought that was really kind of cool, but it didn't work um, mainly because of COVID. They were just on the up and coming yeah. and then, you know, and they're all attorneys and have other lives. And mm -hmm. so it was really difficult for them. So anyway, I approached them and um, because this is the only restaurant I want. Mm -hmm. And originally I had brought on some restaurant cheers, a, a couple that own a couple of really great restaurants in town to be my partner because I didn't really want to run a restaurant. I wanted to, you know, have a restaurant and be partners with somebody and I wanted to do the marketing part of it mm -hmm. so that the both the shop and the cafe would be um, realized you know greater sales yeah. but also to bring more magic to the city because people come here for the magic mm -hmm. they come here for the history tours and the vampire tours and the ghost tours and after they've done the tours there's you know there's nowhere to go there aren't any magical restaurants right. and so with potions our, our speakeasy that's been kind of nice but we have a lot of younger customers too and I mean a lot, you know, people that come here on uh, for the summertime with their children that love vampires and they become big fans. And so I wanted to create something where they could come and dine and have like a longer experience and have a tea leaf reading and, you know, hang out in the courtyard. And so um, I talked to these, this couple about it and um, they are, like I said, very successful restaurateurs. So they put this huge proposal together that was lovely, but it was, um, too extensive for the building, like for the owners to even accept. It was gonna be about a year before we even opened, like renovating everything, you know? Yeah. And so they said no. And I said, well, wait a minute, I have a plan B because I, I want this place, right? Mm -hmm. So I did a plan B and luckily they accepted it. And, and only one time did I kind of have a, a lump in my throat, like what the hell am I doing? Yeah. Um, but I just had this feeling that, you know, with all the tours that come in front of my shop and talk about the vampire shop and us being number one on TripAdvisor and having so many great customers that follow us, you know, and repeat customers that come every year and buy online and want to go to all the, everything we offer. We do vampire adventures where you can come and live as a vampire for three nights and two days, or you can do it for one day, or you can do it, you can run it through your whole uh, vacation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, you know, are doing that now, which is, it's really fun, actually. Mm -hmm. If you ever go to New Orleans and want to experience the real like mysticism or vampire story, we'll put you in the story with one of our, mm -hmm. our adventures, and we can explain to you. So it can be very reasonable, and you know, you can do what you want to do. But anyway, so um, I just it just felt right. I knew it was the right thing to do, and it's when I get this feeling like with the potions, my speakeasy, um, it's almost like it's doing it without me as part of it. Mm -hmm. And it happens a lot to me like that. Like when I really have something, it's like it, it starts moving. And I, if I were to try to stop it, I couldn't. But if I were to stop and think about it, I would probably freak out. But I don't. <laughs> yeah. It's like my, the other me doing it. And I'm just kind of like there to support what's going on. I don't know. It's hard for me to explain, but it's a pretty weird experience. Um, and so we only we got the keys November 16th. 
and we opened um, very magically on New Year's Day, which is the same time we opened the Vampire Shop 18 years ago on New oh, Year's wow. Day. Wow! Yeah. Also, the Oceans three years ago on New Year's Day. Oh. So, um, it's actually <laughs> each of them on New Year's Eve for like private events, but uh, it's crazy it, and total coincidence. And that has to be some kind of magic too. Yeah. You know? But that we were able to do it that quickly. I hired a chef December 1st and he would, he completely revamped the kitchen. Mm -hmm. He is a phenomenal chef. So I had to revamp my marketing a little bit because we weren't originally going to be as upscale as we are now. Um, it's more fine dining, but yeah. I really liked his concept because it's like you would eat. It's a, a lavish vampire meal. Yeah. How you would eat dine if you were a guest of a vampire mm -hmm. rather than like, you know, a Buffy burger or a <laughs> sandwich. You actually mm -hmm. have like, you know, really delicious cuisine, uh, steak tartare, scallops, um, fried deviled eggs, but we have really great things. But I did want to put the customers in the, um, experience so we named all of our drinks especially drinks after blood types so rather than ordering you know a dirty martini you're ordering a, a positive or you know so that makes it really fun for everybody. yeah definitely i um actually did one of the mail in adventures oh you did Good. yeah and um it was saint germain <laughs> okay yeah so i have a little bit of um background with saint germain myself <laughs> okay. so yeah it was exciting um i can definitely again vouch for the vampire adventure like whether you want to do it mail-in or in person i'm sure is fabulous i can only imagine how much fun that yeah. would be <laughs> some are really fun like one of them you have to go to the vampire hunting kit and you go to all these secret places and there are lots of secret places in new orleans so i love sharing that and we, we kind of consider ourselves the magical concierge of the French Quarter. Mm -hmm. So we send people to all the other magical shops and mm -hmm. some secret little hidden restaurants yeah. and, you know, uh, little bars and things. So it's mm -hmm. pretty fun. But something you asked um, about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's a lot more difficult now mm -hmm. to have a restaurant. And in a way, I think it really helped me because we're very limited on the seating that we have. Right. And if I were to, to have opened a restaurant in this very popular location, we're in a very good location, mm -hmm and just open the doors, I think it would have been very difficult knowing very little about restaurants. Uh, um, I would have, we would have been playing catch up a lot. Yeah. So now I have a great staff again. They all have a great restaurant business, you know, our bartenders, our servers, our chef. And so they've guided me a lot and we're, we're ironing out all the kinks now so that when COVID restrictions are lifted, we'll yeah. really hit the ground running. Yeah. You know? so, so it all yeah. kind of just flowed and worked out really. Yeah, it really has. That's great. But we've been okay. I mean, it's been yeah. you know, pretty consistent. So, yeah. and um, so, um, you said that you switched to an online. Uh, well, you've always had your online store, but it's become more prevalent since COVID. Is there any other ways your business have ha businesses have changed since last March? Yes, um, we also opened up an Etsy store. Uh, where we just sell our candles and a couple of items that we make ourselves. Um, and then we also have been doing a lot on social media. Mm -hmm. So Leah is our social media guru and she posts on Instagram and um, we have an Instagram store and a Facebook store and Google store, you know, we open. And so we really try to tackle it from every avenue. Yeah. And I mean, I highly recommend that to other businesses. You know, if you have an online presence, investigate all these, like Google has helped a lot mm -hmm. and Instagram for sure and, and Facebook. So when we put something up, there's a lot of attention and um, it's, it's, I mean, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It is a lot of work and, and doing it correctly and figuring out the algorithms. Yeah. I mean, it's a nightmare really, but uh, it's important, you know, in this yeah. limit at least. Mm -hmm. It's uh, reaching a whole new audience. Uh, the audience that, you know, really doesn't go very much or want to do very much other than maybe be on their phones or online a lot and you know that's become a very modern day uh thing is you know the online presence so yeah. it, it it definitely um boosts you know a, a good way to boost your business in the the brick, brick and mortar and um can and during times like these <laughs> I mean, we learned so much, like how important the pictures, the quality of the pictures are, yeah. um, you know, and even like I, I went through, I mean, we literally worked, I worked at, when, during COVID, uh, the first lockdown from like eight in the morning until midnight, every single day on the computer. And I got to where I was having like 
these I, I was had so much anxiety because I was so happy that um, one of our employees, Kim, came up with these vampire mystery boxes, mm -hmm. and I had no idea they were going to be so successful. But it was brilliant, and people love them. And so you get um, we we have a whole nother offshoot for our business on just mystery boxes, but they're so much fun. Mm -hmm. So you get a compilation of different things, you know, from our shop, and yeah. you never know what you're going to get. We have subscription ones, and we have one-offs, and it's really amazing. But so. Um, you know, like I said, the photo photography and also descriptions and the way you um, organize the products in different categories and yes. there's so much to learn. So yeah, I definitely I mean, recommend taking the time to learn all that and, and doing it for your business. So final question, uh, what, uh, what other advice do you, could you give to um, small businesses who might be struggling amidst the pandemic? So depending on where you are, I mean, I highly recommend teaming up with other businesses. Mm -hmm. So I have a good relationship with Vampire Wines, Vampire mm -hmm. Vineyards, and we did a few promotions with them um, during the pandemic. But, you know, even other like like businesses, uh, Vampire Tea Company, um, you, you know, reach out and then you guys can develop a marketing plan together. So now all of a sudden you have another set of clientele yeah. that you weren't hitting before. And you can do that with many businesses. Yeah. And so I, in fact, I need to do that more again with other businesses. It really, it just it broadens your horizons. Mm -hmm. And other than, uh, yeah, focusing on the internet, I think, you know, during the pandemic, internet is really everything. Yeah. Uh, mailing lists are really important. We found that our mailings to our like current customers and other customer lists that have you know people that have wanted to be on our list, uh, they do better per um, per hit than mm -hmm. social media does. Yeah. So growing your mailing list is really important, and we need to do a better job of that also mm -hmm. actually. So that's a big one, mailing lists, and then. Um, uh, yeah, you know, working with like businesses or businesses that you work with or, or totally different businesses. Like there's escape rooms, you know, and they oh, yeah. have a hard time and doing stuff with them. I mean, just synergy, working with other, yeah, other people. Yeah. Yeah. It's become, the focus has definitely become more collaborative yes. um, and cooperation and inclusiveness. And it looks like that's where we might be headed, you know, as a society. Yeah. I agree. I can't wait to hug people again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, there is something about that human element that mm -hmm. you know, we all crave and I hope it's not going to be too much longer. We're all doing our part for sure, but, um, it's, it's hopefully it'll be over soon. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, Ms. Crandall, thank you again for taking time out of your, what I imagine is a bustling schedule to be with us today. Um, we, as a special thank you, Marita is giving everyone who leaves a comment, calls their local Livingston Parish Library, or visits her shop and emails her a book plate, as well as the link to her vampire short story. So if you want any of these special offerings, again, leave a comment on the video, call your local library, contact Marita either by her email, by her, go to her website. It's all her info, contact information is there. Um, I will put that information um, down below. Thank you. <laughs> and also be sure to check out our Facebook page, Livingston Parish Library, for future and upcoming virtual events. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's been really fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.